Glory. Amen. Amen. Boy, it's hard to believe that these days have slipped by, isn't it, brother? My, my. Uh, it's been so good um, just to have Brother Paul here with us. Haven't been. Have you been blessed? Would you say amen? Yes. yes. I appreciate the, uh, him using the, the Word of God the way that he has. And it's been so good to get to know him really one-on-one. -on -one. We've a, a fellowshiped and prayed and enjoyed our time together. Uh, been, been such a, a blessing. So, brother, you come again tonight. Lord bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Well, I love this preacher and I love this church. And I thank the Lord. That the microphone is now on, all right? I thank the Lord that I get to be with you again tonight. And uh, several friends joining us. Great to see them. And how many of you are members of this church? Would you raise your hand just for a moment? Can I thank you? Uh, not just for coming and bringing people. That's wonderful. Crowds growing each, each meeting. Uh, but I know, I know there's been a lot of prayer that's gone into this meeting. May I tell you, I'm testifying now from the preacher's standpoint, you can always tell in a meeting when people have been praying. I'm in different places every week. And frankly, I hate to tell you this, but some places I show up and I almost think they're surprised. Like, oh, we were going to have a meeting this week? Is that right? That was this week, wasn't it? And uh, usually you see some things happen, but you don't see all you could have seen. But I feel like from the very first meeting on the Lord's Day all the way to this point, we've just had the, the divine aid of the Holy Spirit. And that is not because of the preacher. That is because of the prayers. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. And I know this, when I preach the Word of God, if the Lord works and the Holy Spirit moves, somebody somewhere has been in the presence of the Lord and has been praying. And so I want to thank you for praying for me, and I covet your prayers, not only tonight, but in the days ahead. And I'm praying for you and praying for the rest of the week. I believe the Lord has much more for this church. And not just this week. I'm just excited about the days ahead. I think the most fruitful season this church is ever going to know are the days that lie ahead. And the Lord has laid the foundation for that, and we give God glory. Uh, ladies, that song you sang tonight just couldn't have been any better. Uh, you know, you bring every difficult thing to God, and every good thing grows out of that. And, um, oh, Elisha Hoffman was the man who wrote, I Must Tell Jesus. He was a preacher. Any of you know the name Elisha Hoffman? He was a minister, and uh, that song, like so many songs, grew out of a story and a sorrow. He was called to a, a house one afternoon, and a woman was just beside herself. She was dealing with grief and overcome with emotion and uh, sobbing uncontrollably and couldn't, couldn't gather herself. And he said, I sat down in the parlor of her house, and he said, I quoted every scripture I knew, and I read psalms to her, and I sang to her, and I prayed over her, and I said every comforting thing I could say. And he said, nothing I said helped her. Nothing. And he said, finally, in a moment of desperation, he looked across the living room with that woman and said, Madam, you're just going to have to tell Jesus. And he said, at that moment, she stopped, and light came on her face. And her, her tears stopped, and she said, that's it. And he said, right in front of him, that woman got off the sofa and got down in the floor on her knees and began to pour out her heart to God. And he said, in a matter of just a few moments, she got up from that place of prayer with the Lord's strength in her soul and victory on her countenance. And Elisha Hoffman went home and wrote, I must tell Jesus. I think it's a pretty good principle. What do you think? And may the Lord help us all to apply it. Well, let's get to the Word of God tonight. Where would you like to go in the Bible tonight? You, you get to pick tonight. What book would you like to go to? Hebrews. All right. Well, let's go to Hebrews then, if that's where you want to go. And what chapter would you like to go to? Okay, then let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. That'd be good. And uh, some of you just joining us tonight think, what kind of preacher is this? Let's the people pick the text. But we've been living in Hebrews this week, and what a glorious time we've had. We started early on the Lord's Day with the opening verses of Hebrews chapter 1, and we learned that God spoke, and God didn't just speak in the past. Praise God, God speaks today. And God has spoken to us this week. And then we look to Jesus. We look to the sun, and we learn some things morning and evening about what we see and what we can't see. And we got our eyes off this world and fixed on Christ, I trust. 
And then last evening, we concentrated ourselves in Hebrews chapter number three. One word. Let's see if you remember the word, class. What was the word? You did listen. That's good. And the will of God is not future tense. The will of God is present tense. It is always today. Now we turn our attention to Hebrews chapter number four. And just like last evening, I'm really going to concentrate on the second half of the chapter, but I'm going to read the whole thing to you because the first half of it really lays the foundation for everything I want to show you tonight. In fact, let's just do this. Let's back up to the end of chapter three. Can we do that? Uh, you do know chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. Now, I'm glad we have them. Uh, they've just come into being the last few hundred years. If we didn't have them, we'd all still be looking for Hebrews chapter 4 right now. So I'm glad we have them, but you've got to read through them to get uh, what old Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. So let's back up just a little bit. Look at the end of chapter 3. It's about the children of Israel, remember, coming out of Egypt and wandering in the wilderness and then failing to enter the promised land. And why did they not enter? Look at verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Time out just a second. Pause and look at me. Do you know what faith is? I'm going to tell you what faith is. Faith is rest. It's resting on Jesus. It's leaning all of yourself on the Lord and not on another. I remember years ago, I was walking down the street in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I gave a gospel tract to a man, and his businessman, and he was kind. He wasn't rude about it, but he said to me, I'll never forget this, he said, Christianity's a crutch. And before I could realize what was coming out of my mouth, I know the Lord helped me know what to say to him, but I hadn't planned it. I said to the man, you're exactly right. And he said to me, no, no, I said Christianity is a crutch. And I said, I heard what you said. I agree with you. He said, I don't think you understand what I'm saying to you. I don't believe what you believe. And I think what you believe is a crutch that you lean on. And I said, I would just change the way you say it a little bit. It's not Christianity. It is Christ. And here's what I've learned. All of us are wounded souls. Every last one of us have been crippled by sin. And because of that, everybody leans on somebody. And I just made up my mind and said, lean on me. I was going to lean on Jesus. And he's never failed me. May I say to you, that is the essence of what faith is. I could stand here tonight and I could say to you, this is a chair. This is a red chair. This is a, a red chair with four legs. And somebody says, well, he's a smart guy. That's all right. But that's not faith. That's stating facts, but it's not faith. Here's faith. Faith is when I say, I'm going to trust this chair and nothing else to hold me up. That's faith. You know what some people do with God? They say, I believe in God. Sure, I believe in God. Jesus? Oh, I believe in Jesus. Yeah. Bible? Oh, yeah, I believe the Bible. Yeah, I, I think all oh, that's true. But that's not faith. That's, that's mental assent to something. There are people that sit in church houses their whole life and never really put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, if you go stand in a garage, that doesn't make you a car. And if you sit in a church, that doesn't make you a Christian. The only thing that makes you a real Christian is when you put your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so faith in itself is a rest, but faith also leads to rest. Look at the verse, verse number three, for we which have believed do enter into rest. There's a, there's a rest of soul. Praise God. I don't have to worry about my future. I don't have to wonder where I'm going where I, when I die. I don't have to work my way to heaven. No, no. I'm resting. Where are you resting, preacher? I'm resting not on a church, not on my past, not on my family, not on some empty hope. I'm resting my eternal destiny on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that's a rest right there. For we which you believe do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. 
For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, by the way, this Jesus is the same name as Joshua in the, in the context here. This is not the New Testament Jesus we're talking about. This is the, the language of the day, but it is the historical character, the Old Testament character, Joshua. Remember Joshua came along after Moses and led them into the promised land? And they said, we've arrived. No, no, no. Because the goal wasn't the promised land. The goal was God. Look, please. It's not just about getting to a place. It's about getting to a person. So look at verse 8. For if Jesus or Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? In other words, a greater than Joshua is on the scene now. Who's the greater than Joshua? The Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. So, so there's a Jesus, Joshua, who could not bring the lasting rest. But hallelujah, there is a Jesus, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ who brings the rest. Look at verse 9. Matter of fact, read verse 9 out loud with me, church. Ready? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Man, I like that. Read that again, would you? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Do you see that word rest? It's the same word as Sabbath. There's a, there's a Sabbath for the people of God. How many tired people are here tonight? Would you raise your hand, please? How many of you worked hard today? How many of you had a long day? How many of you had a long week today? Would you raise your hand, please? Yeah. I know what those days are like. And some of you are saying, hope this preacher can, can get on with it tonight because I'm tired. May I just say to you tonight, the rest we really need is not physical. The rest we really need is spiritual. It's not a place or, or a better circumstance. No, no. It is the person of Jesus Christ and look, friends, this rest, this rest is not future tense rest. This rest is present tense rest. Some people have the idea, well, when I get to heaven someday, then we'll rest. Well, sure, Revelation says we're going to rest from our labors. I got really good news for you tonight. There is a rest that God makes available to us right now, and you don't have to die to get it. How many of you think that's a good thing? So is heaven going to be wonderful? Tell me, is heaven going to be wonderful? Sure it is. You're going to rest from your labor, and you're going to rest from all the suffering and sorrow and sickness, and praise God. I'm looking forward to that rest. But I want you to understand that God offers to his people a rest in the here and now. Praise God for that. And this rest is not passive. It is active. Look on, look at verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. And then look at verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I've marked in my Bible in verse 10, we've ceased from our own works. And in verse 11, let us labor. Somebody says, how do those two things go together? I'm glad you ask. Because when the Lord brings rest to your soul, it doesn't mean you plop down on a church pew on your blessed assurance and do nothing for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that you just shift it into neutral and coast into glory. That's not what we're talking about. See, there's some people waiting to have this old special spiritual moment where suddenly they're made super Christian and they never have to labor, never have to work, never have to apply themselves again. I just want you to know, brother, sister, that day is never going to come. Because the Lord has designed it that his rest doesn't mean you're passive and do nothing. His rest is such a, such a replenishment of strength in your soul. It's, it's an inside rest. You know what it does? It produces even more labor for the Lord. You're laboring out of the rest that God has given to you. Eleven times, eleven times in this short section of Scripture, we find the word rest, almost like God's trying to tell us something. I don't know how it was at your house, at our house growing up, and my mother said it once, we were supposed to listen. How many of your mothers were like that? Yes. And if she said it twice, we were really supposed to listen. Amen? And if she said it three times, it was too late to listen. You know what I mean, right? Can you imagine a God using the same word 11 times in the same passage? Rest, 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 rest. Now, I tell you tonight, we're living in a weary world. People are tired. 
Every week of my life and my travels, I watch people. Did you know it's fun to watch people? It's better than television, I'm telling you now. Go with me to an airport, find you a rocking chair, sit over in the corner, and just watch. It's fascinating. And it's tragic. Because you can see it in their eyes. People are weary. They're weary with life. They're weary with the need of the nation. They're weary with wayward children. They're weary. There's some weary people in here tonight. Can you hear Jesus? Come unto me, he said. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. He's the God of rest. In a weary world, there is a rest that is found only in Jesus Christ. It's not taking a nap. It's not retiring. It's not getting a longer vacation. That's not the rest you need. It is rest of spirit and rest of soul. And it is a rest that is only given to the people of God. In fact, would you take your pen tonight and would you mark this phrase in verse 9, a rest to the people of God. A rest where we cease from our own empty efforts, where we stop, stop our own trying to produce a better life, where we, where we stop leaning to our own understanding, frankly, where we finally come to the end of ourselves and throw up our hands like the psalmist did and say, Lord, I'm at wit's end. You know what I think happens? I think when we finally get there and say, Lord, I just give up, heaven applauds. That's what happens. And the Lord says, good, because I've been trying to get you there for a long time. May I tell you tonight, some of you are at the end of it. You're just at the end of it. You're at the end of it. You're frustrated. I'm talking to saved people too. Frustrated. It's wonderful to be one of the people of God. How many of you are glad to be one of God's people? It's the greatest joy on earth. May I tell you, the greatest joy and the greatest tragedy many times are woven together in the same people. We have the greatest joy, we're part of the people of God, and the greatest tragedy is we have not yet entered into the rest that God has for his people. And some of you tonight, you're just at the end of it and you're trying to figure it out. i got good news for you. Would you like to know what it is? The end of you is the beginning of him. Old Vance Habner said, when you get to the bottom, you find out the foundation's still there. Somebody said, I just hit a wall, preacher. I hit a wall. You didn't hit a wall. No, no. When you hit the wall, the Lord's going to open the next door. Because the Lord says, there is a rest that remaineth for the people of God. Before I show you how, could I just show you something? This is wonderful. There are three different rests here. Would you mark them in your Bible? If you back up to the end of chapter 3 and the opening verses of chapter number 4, you have the rest of Canaan. The rest that he promised them in the, in the promised land, the children of Israel, the rest of Canaan. And what was that all about? That was about God's fullness, the fullness of the blessing. Look, Canaan wasn't a picture of heaven. Canaan was a picture of the here and now. There were still burdens and still battles, but there were blessings and a fullness of blessing. And God says, if you'll just believe me and obey you, obey me, I've got more for you. May I say to every Christian in this room, some of you got saved. I see some new converts who got saved this week. Back Back here tonight. We're glad. We rejoice. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven. And I see others in this room who've been saved for decades. I don't care how long you've been saved. God has more for every one of his children. And there's another step of faith and obedience God wants us to take. So you got the rest of Canaan. Then when you come down to verse 4 and verse 5, you have the rest of the Creator. At the end of the creation week, what did God do? He what? He rested. What was the point of that? Can I ask you this? Did God rest because he was tired? No, no. He faints not and he never gets weary. Aren't you glad God never goes to sleep? Look, you know why you can go to sleep tonight? You can go to sleep because God works the night shift. He works all around the clock. Sleep is God's reminder to every human being that there's an end to you, but there's no end to him. Do you know why the Creator rested? The Creator didn't rest because he was tired. The Creator rest because he was finished. It was all very good. Can I tell you, look please, that the rest that God offers to us is because he has already finished everything that needs to be done. You don't work it up. 
God sends it down. It's not something you can produce. No, the God of rest puts the rest in your soul. And so you have the Canaan rest, that's fullness. You have the Creator's rest, that's because it's finished. And then you come to the ultimate rest. See, it's all leading to something. Anybody remember what Hebrews is about, this book of better things? It's all about Christ. So would you notice, please, Christ rest? Because that's the rest we're studying here in verse 8 and verse number 9. He's, he's our Joshua. He's our Canaan. He is the one who has finished the work and now brings us into all the fullness of the blessing. And how do you access the rest that Christ gives? One way, by faith. Do you understand some people are going to go to hell because they were trying to work their way to heaven? And I want you to know, nobody gets saved because you work hard enough to get there, friend. I'm going to tell you what you do. You finally come to the end of you, and you collapse in the arms of Jesus, and you say, I can't save myself. Save me. And at that moment, God says, that's all I needed to hear. At that moment, you enter into the rest of salvation that only Christ can give. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Some of us who know that, who believe that, who know we're saved, you know what we're doing on the other side of that? We're trying to work up some kind of victory for ourselves. May I say to you, the Canaan life is only experienced the same way you came out of Egypt. It was by faith they came out of Egypt, and it was by faith they entered into Canaan. Look, the only way you got saved was through faith in Christ, and the only way you're going to enter into the fullness of the blessing is through simple faith faith. You cannot make it happen on your own. You need Christ. This little word rest, I've been studying it this week and meditating on it. You know what it means? It comes from a root word that means down. How many of you got so tired, ever got so tired, you just collapsed in bed? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You just, boom, just fell on the couch. You just went what? You went down. May I Tell you where Jesus is right now? He went back to the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And you know what he did when he got there? Tell me what he did, church. He sat down. You know why he sat down? Not because he was tired. He sat down because he was finished. Look, please. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated down at the right hand of the Heavenly Father at this moment, has made a way so that we could sit there in heavenly places with Him and enjoy the same glorious victory and power and fullness and blessing and rest. And how only as we are willing to trust Him. Let's take a survey. How many of you would like to live the rest life? Would you raise your hand? All right, I want to show you how. Because when you come to the second half of Hebrews chapter number 4, he identifies three specific things that God has given his people. Here are the resources for that rest he gives to his people. Would you mark them in your Bible? Here's the first in verse number 12, 4. The Word of God. Take your pen and circle in verse number 12, the Word of God. If you want rest, you must begin with the Word of God. Now why is that? Romans tells us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Let me just ask, how many of you in the last three days, not just through the preaching of the Word, but through living in Hebrews and meditating on it, have found your faith growing a little bit? Would you raise your hand, please? May I just tell you, that is not limited to revival meetings. That is supposed to be the daily experience of the child of God. Anybody in this room need more faith? I'm just curious. Anybody here need more faith? All right, I'm going to tell you how to get more faith. You don't get more faith by trying to have more faith. You don't get more faith by just hanging around people who have faith. You don't get it by osmosis. You don't get more faith by simply asking God to give you faith. You get faith by feeding your faith. Look, whatever you feed grows. You feed the unbelief, it grows. You feed the faith, it grows. And what is the food for faith in the soul? It is the Word of the living God. And this is fascinating to me. I was in my devotions a few weeks ago. It's how I came to, to this section of Scripture. Early one morning, sitting in my living room with a cup of coffee in hand. Everything's better with a cup of coffee in hand. You know that, right? 
I could take it right to the chair where I was sitting, and I was reading through this chapter, and I was saying, yes, Lord, I want that rest. Yes, Lord, I want to believe you. Yes, Lord, I want to live the victory life. And suddenly it dawned on me that this verse we so often quote about the Word of God being quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword is in the context of faith and victory and blessing. Do you understand? God doesn't just tell you, go live the Christian life. God gives you everything you need to live the victorious Christian life. Peter says he gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Look, I'm not preaching a night for tonight. I'm preaching a night for six weeks from tonight. See, I'm leaving here. I'm leaving here. I'm not staying here in this place, and you must go on with your life. And this meeting cannot go on forever. I said to the pastor today, when I come to meetings like this, I'm not thinking just about what went into the meeting. I'm asking what's going to grow out of the meeting. You know what I pray? I pray there'll be some people in this church that fall in love with the Word of God again and fall in love with the God of the Word again and get in the Word and let the Word get in them. And as you do, faith will well up in you, and you will enter into the rest that Christ has for you. So, the Word of God. Now look at the verse, verse number 12. He tells us, first of all, the character of the Word. It is quick and powerful. Mm. Sounds a lot like God, doesn't it? Alive and powerful. I don't know about you, I'm glad I have a living God and He's full of power. The Bible says God has exalted His Word above His name. You understand that the nature of God is wrapped up in this book. This is not just any book. No, no, this is God's revelation of himself, so you can trust it. It's alive. It was fascinating to me, Pastor, on the Lord's Day, to just preach the Bible, just preach the Bible, and God met needs in this auditorium that I did not even know existed. That's fascinating to me. Last night, I preached. People here, I didn't know. And uh, since last night, we've been hearing from people that God brought conviction to their soul and people getting right with God and right with one another. Let me just tell you something. That is not the preacher's work. That is the work of the Word of God. It's amazing to me. This, this is a miraculous book. Look, you just open the book and unleash the truth of God, and the truth of God will transform your soul. You know what I think sad? We've raised a whole generation of Christians who run to Christian bookstores looking for the latest bestseller to try to find out some formula and equation for living in the victory and power of God when God wrote it down in black and white in his own book, and we don't even read the book God wrote. George Whitfield, the great preacher of the Great Awakening, said, God condescended to become an author, and most Christians will never even read the book he wrote. What are we going to say at the judgment seat of Christ when the Lord says, how would you like my book? What has God said to you recently from the Word? I'm not asking, have you heard a sermon lately? I'm asking, has God spoken to you lately through the Word of the living God? Because it is quick, it's alive, and it's powerful. Oh, but that's not all. Look at the verse again. It's not only the character of it. Look at the cutting of it. He says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. See, the first work of the Word of God is to wound us. I got to tell you, people don't like that either. I mean, when you go to churches, people want somebody to get up and make them feel good. I have to fight it in my own mind. I stand in front of an audience. And you look at an audience, and there are people there that just want to be entertained. They tell me a story. Make me laugh. Entertain me for a few minutes. I didn't come to entertain you tonight. If you want to laugh, go, go, go watch some comedian somewhere, and you can laugh. But I want you to know, what we're dealing with tonight is serious business. I didn't come to give you some little speech and, and, and some oratory, some rhetorical skill. That's not what I'm here for tonight. I'm here to give you the word of the living God because, look, it goes deeper than the surface. It gets all the way down to the heart. And the same word that heals must first wound. Look, it's the incision. Mm. It's the incision of the great physician. The scalpel of God is the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word. You know what God does? Look, God brings you into His room and puts you under the x-ray machine of the Word of God. 
And the x-ray machine, the, the true light of God, reveals things that are there that should not be there. And then God takes his word and starts to cut out of your life everything that doesn't look like Jesus and graft into your life everything that does look like Jesus. Let the Lord do his work in your heart through the word of the living God. And whatever God says to you, agree with God's word because God's word is always right. And then look at the end of the verse. Here's the confrontation of the word. Because the Bible says that it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not a one of us in this room are what we say we are. Not one of us. And none of us are what others think we are. We are all what God knows us to be. Would you like to know why God gave his word? Somebody said, God gave his word to reveal himself. That's true. But God not only gave us his word to reveal himself, God gave us his word to reveal us to us. That's why it's a mirror. Maybe that's why we don't want to spend much time in it. I must tell you that when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror of God's word, so often I see dirty things and unclean things. So often I see things that do not reflect the beauty of Christ and the glory of God. And what's the Lord doing? He's showing me what he already knows to be true. He's helping me to see me like God sees me. That's why you need the word. That's why you need it every day, not one day a week and not one week a year. Dear Lord, if you're going to be the people of God living in rest, you must have the word of the living God. Look at verse number 14, seeing then, excuse me, verse 13, neither is any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He's, he turns the light on. Is the Holy Ghost turning the light on you right now in any area of your life this week? Is the Holy Ghost shining a light over in the corner anywhere? You know where the cockroaches have gathered and, and the, cro the, the cobwebs have gathered and, and the dust and dirt is in the corners and recesses of your heart and life, your imagination, your, your mind, your motive, your, your feeling towards another brother or sister. Is, is the Holy Ghost turning the light on in any area? Then pray this prayer. Oh, God, be thorough with me in that area. Of my life. And so first we have the word of God. Oh, but that's not all. Look at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Would you circle just like you marked in verse 12, the word of God. Would you mark in verse 14, the son of God. So we not only have the word of God, we have the son of God. And who is the son of God? He tells us his name. His name is Jesus. Would you say that name with me, church? Jesus. That's a beautiful name. Say it again, would you please? Jesus. There's no name like that name. I love the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Look at his name and his title coupled together. Do you see it in your Bible? Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is the name of his humanity. Son of God is the title of his deity. Because he's not one or the other, he is both. He is all man touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and yet he is all God able to do something about it. You know, sometimes there are people who are able to help you. They really are if they wanted to, but they're not sympathetic. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And then on the other hand, you got some people that really are sympathetic and they feel sorry for you, but they have no ability to change the situation. How many of you have seen that before? I got good news for you about Jesus, the Son of God. Look, please. He is full of sympathy and he's able to meet your need. Which means he knows, he cares, and he is willing to do what needs to be done. I want you to mark something in your Bible. In verse number 14, would you mark this? We have. It never dawn on you, it doesn't say we're going to have him. It says we have him right now. You know, this whole period we've come through in our country in the last two or three years, it's been a trial. It's been a trial of, of faith and a trial of a lot of things. But I'm just going to tell you, li listen to my heart for just a moment. God's people need to stop fussing about what we don't have and start rejoicing again in who we do have. I hear people talking about the good old days. Well, they're not quite as good as you remember them, first of all. And number two, I want you to know, if we're still alive and God's still on the throne, God's still good, which means God has some good things for the people of God right here and now. 
Let's stop talking about what's been taken away from us and start thinking about what we have that we can never lose. Let me tell you what, what I have. I have Jesus right now. Look, friend, if you got Jesus, you got everything you need. You, you tell me, is Jesus enough or not? So why are we whining our way to the judgment seat then? Why are we grumbling our way to the throne of God if Jesus Christ is more than enough? We need some of God's people to get the victory back in their soul again. You know how you get the victory? You get the rest. You know how you get the rest? You go back to the Word of God and you go back to the Son of God. I got the Word here to minister to me and I got the Son there. And what is He doing? He's praying for me at this moment. Oh, Robert Murray McShane said, if I could hear Jesus praying for me, I would not fear a thousand enemies. Then he stopped and said, but the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. You can't see him and you can't hear him, but on the authority of the word of God, I will tell you tonight, Jesus Christ has nail pierced hands raised at the right hand of the heavenly father at this moment. And he is praying for every one of us in this room. And by the way, he knows how to get his prayers answered. Look at that verse. Look at verse number 14. Do you see that we have his power? It says he's the great high priest. Israel had high priest through the centuries, but he wasn't just another high priest. He wasn't a high priest after the order of Aaron. No, no. He's a different high priest. He's a better high priest. Look, he's not just the high priest. He is the great high priest. This is the power of almighty God we have at our disposal. You may be weak, but he is strong. You are unholy, but he is holy. You are incapable, but he is all sufficient. You are ignorant, but God is wise. Everything we are not, we have in the person of Jesus, the Son of God. Look at the verse. We not only have his power, we have his prayers. Where is he? He's passed into the heavens. <laughs> Would you use a little sanctified imagination for just a minute? The last time the disciples saw Jesus, what was he doing? Somebody said, well, he was rising up in the air. Well, that's true. But he was doing something as he rose. Do you remember? Luke tells us what he was doing. The Bible says his hands were raised in blessing. Think of this. The last image they had of Jesus, the Son of God, he was praying over them. May I tell you, those hands are still raised in blessing. At this moment, on the other side of the clouds, passed into the heavens, into the holy of holies for us, Jesus Christ is praying for every one of us. He's interceding at this moment. In fact, I got two prayer partners. I got the Holy Spirit in me, and I got the Son of God at the throne. That's a pretty good prayer line right there between earth and heaven, let me tell you. And Christ is praying for us. And then, look at the verse again. We not only have his power and his prayers, we have his pity. Because the Bible says in verse 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Who is Jesus? He is the one who was tempted but without sin and the one who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I don't know the needs in this room tonight. There are young people here, there are older people here, and everybody in between. There are people at every age and stage of life. There are people tonight who are having a great day and life's pretty good right now. There are people in this room who feel like it's coming apart of the seams and you're trying to figure it out. But I'm going to tell you this. Jesus Christ knows exactly what you're dealing with. He feels with you at this moment. And the Son of God is praying for you at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. There is rest in the Word of God. There is rest in the Son of God. And then let me show you the third one. Look at verse number 16. Let us, it's interesting this chapter ends the same way it started with a let us. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Would you circle in verse 16, the throne of grace. So you've got the Word of God, and you got the Son of God, and now you got the throne of God, and he is called the throne of God, the throne of grace, because the God who sits on the throne is a God of all grace. And everything you need is accessed there. In fact, the next chapter, I wish I had time to study with you, chapter 5, is all about our great high priest. Do you know what the high priest did for us? He made us priest. He gave us the same access that he has to the throne of God in heaven. And he says, come on, come on. The door is left open behind him in glory. Come on in any time you want to. What is he talking about? Not only is he praying for us, but he gives us the privilege of prayer. Have you prayed today? 
I'm not asking, did you ask God's blessing over a meal or give God a nod this morning or, or say a prayer as we came in, Lord, speak to us tonight. I'm asking this day, was there any moment when you were conscious you were at the throne of grace? Was there a moment today when you knew you were in the presence of Almighty God? I want you to know there's rest there. This afternoon, I was working on a number of things, and my mind got just kind of racing. You ever have that happen? Phone was ringing and trying to get some things done and a need here and something here to attend to, and, and I finally just put everything away, and I sat down in that little room where I was staying in the corner, and I said to the Lord, Now, Lord, I need your rest. I need your rest in my inner man. I need you to speak peace to my heart. Help me, Lord. And I want you to know, at the throne of grace, I found the rest I needed. I'm laboring in the Word tonight, but I'm not laboring in my strength. I want you to know, no, God's given me some rest in my spirit. I don't have to preach a good sermon tonight. Phew, that's good. All I have to do is lean on the Lord. And God says, I'm going to give you everything you need. You know what we need? We need a revival of some people who learn what it means to pray, not just in leading up to a special meeting, but every day go into the throne of grace, go into the throne of grace. Look at the verse. Now, this is a powerful verse. Look at this verse. Look at verse number 16. He, here's our access. He said, let us therefore come. Do you hear Jesus say come? This is the exact same word that's used in chapter 10, verse number 22, for drawing near. It's the term that was used for the priest. This is pretty good. God made you a priest. Aren't you glad? You're a priest. How many saved people are here tonight? Raise your hand, big and high. All right, turn and look at somebody next to you that just raised their hand. That's a priest you're looking at right there. Somebody said, he doesn't look like a priest. She doesn't look like a priest. Well, God made you a priest. What does that mean? It means God said, come on in. Look, please. You don't have to go through any other man. God will hear and answer your prayers. I don't know about you. That helps me. Look at the verse again. He says, let us come boldly. So here's not only our access, here's our authority. We come boldly into the throne room of God. Some of these little timid prayers, you know, these little mealy mouth prayers where we just kind of, well, Lord, I hope that you're going to, I may be. No, we come boldly because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I came in this meeting tonight and someone said something to me about Ian Paisley. And that's a name I don't hear very often anymore. He's with Jesus. But I remember hearing Ian Paisley years ago, and somebody said, what impressed you about him? It, it wasn't his imposing countenance. It wasn't even his preaching. Can I tell you what stuck with me? His prayers. I have never forgotten his prayers. I had never heard anybody pray like that, Pastor. I remember the night he stood to preach for the first time, and he said, shall we pray? And he bowed his head, and there was a stillness, a holy hush in the place for a few moments. And then this big booming voice, he said, I take in the name of Jesus the power of the Holy Ghost. I thought, my lands, I'd never heard anybody pray like that before. He didn't strut his way in the presence of God. Nobody does. He came humbly, but he came boldly. Do you know why? Because he wasn't coming on his merit. He was coming on the merit of Jesus Christ. There's not a one of us that deserves to get our prayers answered. But hallelujah, God still hears and answers prayer through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Come to the throne of grace. Why do we live like such paupers when there's bread enough and to spare at the Father's house? Why do we live such substandard lives when we have a God who is great and mighty? Why do we pray such little tiny prayers to a God that is so big? You want to live in rest again? Then get on your knees and come to the throne of grace. Look at the verse. There's not only access and authority, there's assurance he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. What's the assurance that the throne is a place of grace? See, in ancient times, the throne was not always a place of grace. Look, please. You better wait. You better wait. You better wait and see if the scepter is extended. Do you remember Esther? You better wait. You better watch. You better not come to that throne that throne is a place of justice and judgment. That place is a place of authority. That's all true. And somebody said, you better wait. I don't know if the scepter's out. I got good news for you. At Calvary, Jesus extended the scepter, and he never did take it back. 
The scepter is to you, my friend. You, 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 not your pastor, not the evangelist, not somebody else you have great regard for. You, my friend, have access into the presence of the creator God of the universe. And we're too busy. Too busy running around like chickens with our head cut off trying to fix it all and figure it out to come boldly to the throne of grace. Look at the verse again. There's our access and our authority and our assurance and then our abundance. When you get to the throne, what do you find? Two things. First, you obtain mercy and then you find grace. And I love the divine order here. Because mercy is what he withholds and grace is what he gives. Look, please. He says when you get there, God's going to hold back what you deserve and he's going to give you what you don't deserve. Oh, we're just a bunch of unworthy, undeserving sinners. But I'm going to tell you, when I come to God, he sees Jesus. That staggers me. When I come to God... He sees the blood of Christ. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Look at it, please. Here's the aid to help in time of need. Anybody here need any help tonight? Anybody? Anybody's family need help? Anybody's marriage need help? Anybody's children need help? Anybody's grandchildren need help? Anybody think this community or this nation needs help right now? Well, I want you to know there's help in the time of need when God's people come to the throne of grace. And today it hit me. I told you I've just been living out of the overflow of what I'm, I'm trying to spend my own time in Hebrews in these days and just sharing with you what things God's showing me. It hit me today that there is a seismic shift in Hebrews that in the previous chapters, they're all out in the wilderness. But by the time you get to this chapter, they're not in the wilderness anymore. They're in the Holy of Holies. Now I'm going to tell you what God wants for every one of his children. Look, God wants everybody in this room, get out of the wilderness tonight. Get out of the wilderness. Come on, get out of the wilderness. You're not supposed to be out there wandering in circles trying to figure it out. You're not supposed to be trying to make this happen on your own. Get out of the wilderness. Where, where do I go to? I'll tell you where you go to. The veil's been rent in twain. The throne room's open. You get to come right into the presence of creator God of the universe through the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You get to come live, not visit, live in the holy of holies. Watch Jesus stretch out a nail-pierced hand and say, come on, I'll take you to the Father's house. I want you to know this is the rest that is available to the people of God. God has spoken to us this week. God's spoken to me. I give him glory. But as I stand here tonight on the last night that I have with you, you know what I'm really wondering? I'm wondering if this is it. Like this, okay, so this is it now. This is as far as we're going to go. Is this it? You tell me, class, what chapter of Hebrews are we in? Are there any chapters after it? God has much more for his people. Turn a page in your Bible. Just turn one page in your Bible. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, would you mark this? Let us go on unto perfection. For all the glorious things we've seen about Jesus this week, God says, I got so much more for you. Don't you think it's high time we get up out of our rut? Old Vance Havner said, a rut's just a grave with both ends knocked out of it. It's death. Don't you think, look, don't you think something ought to kick us out of our ruts and we say, I'm tired of sitting here just living this kind of nominal average kind of Christianity. I'm not going to sit here till I die. I'm not going to live and die this way. I'm going to go on with God. I want all God has for me. I want you to know if that is your heart, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me tonight? Oh, what a joy it's been to study the Word of God with you. I'd like you to close your eyes as tightly as you can for a moment. Would you do that? And imagine, imagine that there's no one in this room but you and Jesus. I'm not here. Those around you are not here. It's just you and Jesus. Because that is exactly the way it's going to be someday. How do you want to meet him? 
You want to meet him like you are right now? Or is there anything that needs to change? How many of you in this room tonight can honestly say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. I, I'm a long ways from perfect. I got my own things to deal with. But I know God has saved me. I've put my faith in him. And he lives in my heart, and I'm going to live in his heaven. I know I'm saved. Would you raise your hand big and high towards heaven right now? Keep it there just a moment, would you please? Would you thank him for that right now? Just thank him right now for saving your soul. Isn't it wonderful to have that assurance? You may lower your hands, and I must ask this question. Who in this room tonight would say, Preacher, I couldn't raise my hand a second ago with confidence. I won't embarrass you. You just be honest and say, Preacher, I'm not certain that I have that kind of relationship with God, with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but I need that. I'm concerned for my soul. I'm concerned about where I'm going to spend eternity. Preacher, I'm not 100% ready for heaven, but I want to be. Pray for me. I want you to raise your hand with mine right now, just quickly, long enough for me to see it, and then pull it back down and say, Pray for me, preacher. I'm not certain I'm really a Christian. I need to be saved. I need my sins forgiven. Pray for me. We wait just a moment. I'm looking carefully. Anyone like that, pray for me. I need Christ. I need him. Then best I can tell tonight, I'm speaking to believers, so I want to ask a couple questions. Would you be honest? How many Christians in this room would say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I haven't been living in the rest? I've been troubled. I've been trying. I've been frustrated. And I'm sitting here tonight hungry, thirsty. I want that. I want all God has for me. Preacher, I want that rest. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand with mine right now all over this building? Hold it high just a moment. Yeah, that's a lot of us. Let's go down the line, shall we? How many believers in this room tonight would say, Preacher, I need to make more of the Word of God in my life. I need to spend more time meditating in Scripture and feeding my soul and strengthening my faith in the Word. And tonight, I want to just recommit myself to the Word of God. Would you raise your hand with mine right now? You say, that's me. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. All right, let's go another step. How many of you in this room would say, Preacher, I need to spend more time thinking about Jesus than thinking about others and thinking about myself. What I need to do, I need through eyes of faith to start thinking more about the Son of God and who He is and where He is and what He's doing. And Preacher, help me pray that I'll get my eyes back on the Son of God. Would you raise your hand with mine? You say, that's me. Amen. Now we're really getting down where we all live. How many of us just be honest tonight and say, you know, preacher, the truth is I don't come to the throne of God like I ought to. I pray, but I'm not the person of prayer I ought to be, and God's got so much more mercy and grace for me, and i got so many needs. God knows I need to be there praying, and if the Lord will help me, I want tonight to be a new beginning in my prayer life. Preacher, I don't just want that for this meeting or this service. I want that for the days ahead. I want to live at the throne and live in his rest. Preacher, that's me. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand with mine? Yes. Here's what we're going to do tonight. A little different. I don't mean to be funny. I really don't. I'm being serious about my question. How many of you in this room can kneel? I mean by that you can get down on your knees and get back up again. You know, we take a lot for granted until we can't do it, don't we? But how many of you in this room honestly can kneel? Would you raise your hand, please? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to do that. If you cannot kneel, but you're able to stand, then in a moment I'm going to invite you to stand and make your prayer. There's nothing sinful about sitting down praying. I do it very frequently, certainly traveling. I do it a lot. But in Scripture, you see people on their face in the presence of a holy God or on their feet in the presence of the King. And tonight, out of reverence for our Lord, if you're physically able, we're going to turn this whole room into one big altar. Now, you've been very good to leave your seats and come to this altar and pray. And many of you may want to do that tonight and come here to the front and pray. I would encourage you to do so. But in a moment, we're going to make this whole auditorium one big altar tonight. And I'm going to ask you to find a place in this room somewhere on your knees or on your feet. And for a few moments, we're going to talk to God. Here's the way we're going to do it. I'm going to begin the prayer. I won't say amen. I'll pause and point to the pianist, and when I do, she'll begin to play. And when she hits the first note, 
I'm going to ask you on that very note to find your place of prayer and for a few moments. Let's go to the throne of grace together. Don't you think it'd be good if we all just went to the throne together tonight? This is wonderful. We all came in this room together, but you can go with me to the throne tonight. What do you think of that? Let's all go to the throne of grace together and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Father, there are great needs in this room. There are so many needs I don't know, and if I did know them, Lord, I couldn't fix it. But, oh, God, we believe you're able. And through the blood of Jesus Christ and the precious name of the Son of God, we come now boldly to the throne and pray tonight that you will bring a rest to the hearts of so many Christians that will change the way we live and labor from this day forward. Lord, we want the better things you have for us. And may we enter into that tonight. Right now, she begins to play quickly, quietly. Would you just get up out of your seat? And if you're able to kneel, would you find your place somewhere in this room to get on your knees and talk to God? And if you're not able to kneel, then you're able to stand. Stand to your feet and make your prayer out of reverence for the Lord. I'm going to ask you not to get in a hurry. Please don't get in a hurry. You don't rush into the presence of a holy God. When you get there, you don't want to rush out. Talk to Him. While people are praying, is there someone here with a spiritual need you need help tonight? Is there anybody in this room you say, I have a spiritual need, I, I need some help? I need to talk to somebody. I need somebody to pray with me and for me. Would you just get up out of your place, wherever you are, and just walk right here to the front. The pastor will meet you. Give us an opportunity to help you tonight. Don't leave like you came. 